another celebration with Falling Brook Heights Baptist Church at the Center. We encourage you to prepare your heart, mind, and soul for a time of reflection, learning, and prayer. If you have any questions, or if you're just looking to chat, check out our website, churchatthecenter.com. And now, let's worship. Well, it's wonderful to gather with you here this morning, whether you're here live and can see each other in person, or whether you're joining us virtually online. We want to start our worship together today with Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 is a brilliant call to you, for you. Jesus picks up this call, and you may think, oh, this is what Jesus said, but hold on, we'll talk about how this works in our lives. Because Isaiah wrote this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on us. Because the Lord has anointed us to preach good news to the poor. He has sent us to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. This morning as we worship, Together, as we think of this great call that he's called us into, please stand with me as we sing God of the City. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice when he has made me You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation.
awesome God. There are many things that are going on within church life all around the world. And especially after this pause that we've had called COVID-19, we're seeking to grow and to uh, reinvigorate many of the things that are happening in church life. Many of these things that are happening are organic and uh, just starting up now. So you'll hear more information about them. You can go to our website, churchofthecenter.com, for more information. At The Reach, at our storefront property, 1666 Kingston Road, this week we'll have coffee and conversation from 10 to 11.30. Coffee and Conversation is a program that allows us, allows uh, those that are caring for others with dementia to come together and to have a break, but also to be able to have uh, time together. That's happening at The Reach, 10 to 11.30 on Tuesday, led by Pat Yule. On Thursday at The Reach is our uh, open uh, workspace time. So if you're a person that has a uh, portable workspace or you work from home and you're getting a little tired of the walls around you, you can come and come to 1666 Kingston Road to work there. Thursday from 12 to 5 and Matthew is our host there at Coffee and Conversation. We are playing baseball this year, so you can pray for our baseball team. Tuesday night, you can come and watch us if you'd like to, uh, at uh, Corvette Parquet. So we're playing baseball on Tuesday night. There's many other things that are happening for the good of our community. Please pray for us. Church these days is like playing football. Everyone has a position. Everyone plays. Everyone cheers. And ultimately, everyone wins. Mm, that's a concept we've lost, in, uh, uh, especially through COVID. And so you can check out 1 Corinthians 12, where it talks about that dynamic. You have a place on this team. You can join us on this team and connect with me or one of our leaders to seek how you can be part of this. We're going to sing again, Clean Hands. Please stand with me if you're able, and we're going to sing Clean Hands.
souls to another Give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Oh God, let us be a generation that sees Sees your face, oh God of Jacob Oh God, let us be a generation that sees Sees your face Hello, it's Patricia Griffin, your missions representative. It's May, the flowers are finally starting to bloom, and it's Missions Month. This May, we are once again partnering with Compassion Canada to raise funds for an initiative focused in Mexico. Last year, we raised almost $3,000 to help families learn how to create their own backyard farms. There's a completion report and video on our website if you would like more information. This year, our fundraising efforts will provide support to families living in the same area, which is just north of Mexico City, through Compassion's Mom and Babes, Mums and Babies Survival Program. As you will see in the video that follows, Compassion is already running this program in many other areas of need all around the world. We are also supporting mums and babies in need locally by collecting supplies for the Pregnancy Care Center's Scarborough office, including diapers, baby wipes, and new and gently used baby clothes. If you have items to donate or would like more information, please speak to me or to Melanie Wright. For the Compassion Fundraiser, the donation link is already live on our website. Just go to the Missions tab. Or if you prefer, you can write a check designated Compassion Mom, Mom and Baby Survival. Our church has committed $1,000 from the Missions budget and we're looking to raise an additional $2,000 in donations. God bless you as you prayerfully consider supporting this mission. From the first weeks in the womb through the first years of life, parents and caregivers lay the foundation for their children's lifelong growth and development. Bright futures begin here. <coughs> But for families living in poverty, the future is uncertain. The dreams parents have for their children too often come with a question mark. Resources and education are limited, and infant mortality rates are high. But Compassion Church partners around the world are reaching out, building relationships with pregnant moms and caregivers, and equipping them to establish healthy practices that set their children up for success. Tabangan na mo sila, nga makaanak sila, nga ang ilahang mga anak, safety sila in a, during sa pag-deliver o ang mama po safety. Na ami lesson, nag-hisgot me about breastfeeding, nag-hisgot me about growth monitoring, oral rehydration, family planning, uh, immunization, nga makatabang dyan sa ilahang anak nga mahimo silang physically healthy. The earliest stage of Compassion's program is called survival. Pregnant moms and caregivers receive support through their child's first year with things like doctor's appointments, learning about their baby's development, and practical skills to care for their child's needs. Staff and volunteers from the Child Development Center, known as program implementers, visit moms and caregivers in their homes. Hola, Ismael, ¿cómo estás? Implementers tailor the topics covered during a home visit to the needs of the mother and the child. For mothers who are pregnant, topics may include prenatal care and preparing for birth, even how to register and get a birth certificate. Other topics can include household management and vaccinations. Sometimes implementers need to address cultural superstitions and customs that can hinder a child's healthy development. The program also offers encouragement and support for breastfeeding and helps caregivers know how to meet their child's nutritional needs with local foods. Bueno, lo que más a mí más me gusta es que 
las mamás emocionan cuando ya tienen su bebé en sus brazos y darle la estimulación a ellos para que se vayan desarrollando en muchas áreas, que hay muchos niños que no obtienen eso sin la área de supervivencia y aquí ellos se desarrollan y para mí es muy importante. Kalau dari saya, saya tidak punya mimpi apa-apa, tapi setelah saya masuk ke IPIA, dari situ saya dapat masukan yang banyak. Jadi dari situ saya punya mimpi. Uh, Tuhan, uh, kalau bisa nanti suatu saat anak saya jadi seperti ini atau menjadi seperti orang baik yang lain. Itu 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 doa saya. Dan saya berdoa untuk anak saya. Survival is transforming families and preparing children for long-term holistic development. Porque hemos impactado la, ni la vida de ese niño desde de de su nacimiento, desde el vientre de su madre. Y hemos contribuido y él está cumpliendo un año. Para nosotros es un festejo porque en una zona donde hay un alto índice de mortalidad infantil, eh, ellos están cumpliendo su primer año de vida y hacemos un festejo para transicionarlos a patrocinio de un año en el hogar. Compassion supporters are helping moms and babies in 25 countries. Let's help more babies reach their first birthday and inspire parents with hope for the future. All right, kids, it's time for stretch. So if you want to come to the front and you can sit in the front row, or you can stay where you are if you're here with us in church today. And if you're at home watching, well, Okay, you might want to get close to the screen so you can see because I have some props with me today. So once again this week, I brought my baseball glove and a baseball. And no, it's, it's, not, it's not Tuesday yet, so I'm not ready for the game on Tuesday. But I brought my glove and my ball because we're going to talk about baseball. You see, I played baseball growing up and it was one of my favorite sports and it still is today. And one of the great things I learned from baseball is how it's a team sport. Everything you do in baseball requires the help of someone else, usually one of your teammates, especially when you're fielding. Because if you're, say, the shortstop, and you field the ball and you throw it to somebody else, well, that person has to then catch it to record the out. You can't do it all by yourself, especially if you're way on one side of the field and you got to throw it to first base, which is all the way on the other side of the field. Right? Teamwork. And even when you're doing other things like running the bases, hitting the ball, whatever, teamwork is so important in baseball. And it got me thinking, well, the Bible's got to talk about teamwork too. And it does. And one verse that came to my mind was found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it, it talks about our bodies and how we're part of the body of Christ and how we're all important parts of the body, but then also we're part, important parts of a team. Right? The first baseman can't say to the shortstop, well, I don't need you on the team. You, you, you know, you're all the way over there. You don't help me. I don't need you. Because, well, who's going to field the ball when it's hit over that way? Or the pitcher can't say to the catcher, yeah, I don't need you. You don't need to be there to catch the ball. Because, well, then who's going to catch it? It's going to hit the umpire every time. And he's not going to, or he or she will not be too happy. And so in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, quickly going through it, it says the foot should say because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. Well, could you imagine if we didn't have feet? How would we walk or run around? Or the eye. The eye says or if the ear should say because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. Well, what if we didn't have ears? Couldn't hear anything. You wouldn't be able to hear your parents asking you for help or you wouldn't be able to hear us our stretch lesson or our church service or your teachers or anything. Or even if the, the whole body were an eye. Could you imagine you were an eye? Like that monster in Monsters, Inc. just walking around as a big giant eye? Well, you might be able to see everything really well, but you might not be able to like taste food or smell things too good because you wouldn't have a nose or a mouth. And so just as all these parts of the body can't be by themselves, we, they, have to be the, they have to be part of the body connected for us to, to function and to be just like we have to be part on a baseball team or a hockey team or a soccer team or whatever team we're part of we have to be we're all equally important 
whether you're the catcher, the pitcher, the first baseman, the shortstop, doesn't matter what position you are. Same in church. We're all important, and we all play an amazing role in being part of God's team or the body of Christ. So kids, but after we pray, if you're here in church with us, we're going to meet in the hall to go out for blast and for jam. And if you're not here with us, we encourage you to stay and, with your, and watch the service so you can learn more about your faith and, and fun and friendships as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. And we thank you that we can be part of your team and other teams that we're part of. That we can be team players and work for one common goal. And that's to learn more about you and to have you grow in our hearts. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Evan. Hey there. Let's clear the air. Like, let's puncture the balloon. Oh, my wife doesn't like when balloons pop, but sometimes it's just got to be done. Or, as we talked about last week, let's enumerate the elephants in this room. Well, write them down, if you will, or journal about those things in your life or in church that we don't talk about often, that we know is there. We sometimes in our own reflections before God pray that aren't there. But today let's take a little different perspective. Let me light some fireworks between us. And let me ask this really offensive question. Are you ready? What's the problem, blowfish? Oh, you may not like the image of a blowfish. You may not think of it very well. So uh, let me ask you to, if you would like to, substitute the skunk or the porcupine. What's the problem, skunk? What's the problem, porcupine? As we dig into this. The blowfish, porcupine, porcupine, skunk have similarities to elephants in the room. You know, they're controversial issues, sometimes inflamed. They blow up, or they blow us up. Uh, they make us prickly, perhaps for our benefit or for our loss. You have to determine that. Uh, we'll get to it. But maybe you don't quite feel ready, especially us analytical perfectionists. But let's jump in. Take a deep breath. As we continue this week in a spiritual excursus in mental health. Excursus, a meandering, a wandering. And we're going to focus on this brilliant connection that we all have. The connection between our mind, our intellect, what we think, our heart, what we feel, our passions and drives, and our soul. Like a triangle of you. Your psyche, as we talked about last week. We're going to talk about it at a broad strokes level. And to be honest, when I thought about this series months ago, I, in my own prayers, said, Lord, I, I'm not qualified. I'm not trained. I, I don't have an expertise in mental health. So please let me off the hook. He didn't. Instead, he gave me three convictions. Number one, the church often avoids conversations of mental health. It makes us uncomfortable, so we don't want to talk about it. But this is the place that it should be discussed. Number two, although mental, mental health conversations can be challenging, the, the Bible is brilliant with respect to mental health. And we'll talk about that. And as your spiritual sibling your brother in Christ, and your pastor. I want to take this excursus, this meandering, this journey with you. And something that I say, I believe, will hit you directly. Uh, something that I say may help you help others. But be careful. We'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, please don't focus on someone else with all their problems. We'll talk about that. That's a dangerous place to be. 
And some of what I say may help you in the future. But let me say this. There was no one, there was no situation, there was no event which led me into this discussion. Uh, it, it isn't personal. As I say that, there will be something that perhaps I say that you say, oh, why is the pastor talking to me like that? I'm not. God is, perhaps. To help you, and perhaps to go deeper, I want to recommend four resources. Four resources which may help you, on a personal level, go deeper with your mental health, and perhaps mental illness. Last week we sp spoke about two organizations, Tyndale, Tyndale University College, you can connect with them. There's information at the back of this room if you wanted to connect with them. And Dr. Grant Mullen, you can go to his website. There's helpful resources that you can contemplate yourself or you can connect with him in his course. He and his wife, I understand, have a blog every week that you can <laughs> connect with. And this week, I wanted to highlight Grace Christian Counseling. Uh, Fanny Tam is a local psychotherapist. We don't use that term in Canada very often. It's more like a therapist. So you can connect with her. You can go to Facebook and type in Grace Christian Counseling if you wanted to connect with Fanny Tam. Or if you wanted something more uh, private, uh, more anonymous, you can go to faithfulcounseling.com, which is on an online Christian counseling site. Uh, I encourage you to do it. Last week we spoke about the truth that if your psyche, your mind, your heart, your soul, if your psyche is made in the image of God, as we spoke about, would it, it be the most important exercise to practice? I think so. And maybe our mental health is something that we want to put at the top of our list for exercising, for working out, so to speak. But above all, here's my question for you. Are you willing to be humble? Are you willing to hope? Are you willing to be helped by God and by others? Are you willing in just a moment to pray with me, to cry out, Oh Lord, help me. Are you willing to do that? Let's pray together asking God to help us and committing to him that we'll listen to him as he listens to us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your great love for us, for making us in your image. We ask you, O oh God, to help us set aside shame, to help us understand better the brilliant way you've made us, body, mind, soul, emotions. Please accept our guilt. Please help release us from obsessions. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Give us clarity, a hunger for your word, and a thirst for righteousness. May the words of our mouths, meditations of our hearts, be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, our Savior. Amen. I confess, now live streaming to the world, I am a blowfish, and I have problems. Uh, Jesus called them troubles. But as I contemplated this, I realized this challenge. I think the real problem in problem assessing is how do you and I really know what the problem is? Uh, in other words, how accurate is your diagnosticator, your MRI, your misery response index? How accurate is your problem assessor? Now just think about it for a moment. Kind of interesting question, isn't it? How do you know when you feel like yourself? I just do, Ken. How accurate would you say you are in assessing your problems? 100%? Uh, would you say you're 90%? Are you 45% accurate in assessing what's wrong? Are you 3% accurate? 
One of the initial problems that we uncover as we talk about what's your problem, Blowfish, is that we actually aren't all that good, I believe, at assessing what our problems are. Hence, help. Hence, friends. Hence, Christian community. And this tension that we feel, that there is something off inside of us, that's the thing to take to God. You see, last week we ended with this truth. Your psyche, mind, mind, soul, spirit, your psyche aligns with the Holy Spirit. Always start with Him in prayer. Seek Him through Scripture, through prayer and trusted Christian community. But let's proceed with our blowfish for today. There's three blowfish that we are going to consider. Three blowfish. The blowfish that we're going to consider today is this one. Blind spots, we all have them. So what? And number two, the poison of our psyche, pride. What do we do with that? And number three... Can God redeem our blind spots, our poison? Number one. First blowfish, blind spots, you and I have them, so what? Well, let's do a little test. Do you know what the back of your head looks like today? Have you seen it? Have you been able to somehow work the mirror so that you can make sure that hair is aligned with your head? The people sitting beside you or behind you can tell you what the back of your head looks like. <laughs> now everyone's little. <laughs> we all have blind spots, right? We all have blind spots, so what do we do with them? Humanity is assailed with problems. Problems, troubles for our psyche. Our problems, you could say they're like crustaceans in our lives. The fish that swim in our psychic sea. Some of these crustaceans need to be handled with care, right? They need to be labeled. Some have great danger. And some become blind spots. So let me pull up uh, like a broad net and just mention these crustacean blind spots, 10 assaults to our psyche, stresses to our mental health. We all experience in them. We're all in the same ocean together. These may or may not be blind spots to you, and I have assigned my own intensity spectrum of which you will then determine how you feel about these potential blind spots. Think about this. Boredom, frustration, loneliness, manipulation, frailty, anxiety, futility, depravity, despair, depression. Oh, these are just some of the words that we would use when we talk about our mental health, right? Keep in mind, we're not talking this morning, we won't, we won't speak in this context of mental illness. That's beyond our scope. We're speaking about mental health. And when we think about these 10 things that I've shared in my net of the psychic C, you will assign your own intensity spectrum. The things in your life that you feel are heaviest. When we speak, though, of the identification, the discernment of what's the problem, Blowfish? It is a natural blind spot for us to look at someone else and point out their problems. It, it, it's just one of the first blind spots that we see in our own lives is that we look at others around us and as Jesus said, we have a plank in our eyes and we look at someone else and say, you've got a sliver. Uh, one of the first blowfish that we should identify in our blind spots is we like to look at others and point out their faults. But let's consider three truths. Number one, all people have 
mental health blind spots. At various times, at various intensities, some go and some remain, but there is no human being that doesn't have mental health blind spots. Number two, some of us, some people have wider, more intense blind spots than others. Let me put it this way. Even in their own assessment, they have less discernment or discretion that impacts us in different ways. And number three, few people in life have blind spots that cause great harm to others. They can become strongholds of difference. Just imagine a ruler around the world from, let's say, Russia, who may have a problem with respect to how his blind spot impacts his operation of being a leader. But let's go deeper and look at the Bible. Uh, let's put our context of our lives in the sea of our blind spots and our blowfish into Scripture. And let's consider one of the sons of Korah. If you have your devices or your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Psalm 42. I'm, we're going to read Psalm 42 together. Please feel, to, feel free to read it with me. I've just omitted verse 6, which applies specifically to the psalmist's context in Israel. You can look at it if you'd like. Let's read together. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. And verse 7, Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and swipers break over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why have you been pressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. Isn't it just fantastic in Scripture that when you read it, it's so deep with respect to touching us where we are. I don't know if you've ever felt what this psalmist is writing about. I was reading this psalm partly by coincidence this week to one of our older saints. And as I read this psalm, she unable to express her words at this point. As I read this psalm, I had to wonder, as a tear ran down her cheek, did she get these struggles perhaps far more than I could ever understand? Just like the psalmist, this Psalm 42, we can flail around trying to understand what's wrong with us. In other words, we all have blind spots. And even though a blind spot can sometimes deeply affect us and affect others around us, truly, the one who gets the worst impact of a blind spot, I believe, is the person who's unable to see it. Now, you may find that a challenging thing to believe, but I believe that when we fail to see the blind spots in our lives, we lose out on what God has for us. We lose the most. So what? So what that we have blind spots? Well, the reality of life is that blind spots steal the richness of life from us. 
We'll go deeper still, but if we willingly acknowledge and work to know what our blind spots are, our relationship with God blossoms. Our relationship with others blossom. Grace enables us to see blind spots and manage them as God intends. For the blowfish, though, not only does it expand in size and uh, adds its prickly spines on the outside, it is also, I learned, filled with poison. It's a good analogy for us in this excursus. I, in my life, have had times in which I feel the prickliness of my character being expanded, and I know inside of me is the, where the poison is. So let's go to the real danger of the blowfish. If, if you're a mighty reptile in the sea and you decide you're just going to eat it anyways, yeah, wait till you get, the, to, get to the jelly filling. Not so nice. The second blowfish, the poison of our psyche, pride. Well, what do we do about this poison? I, I want to... Uh, hear from someone who knew this dynamic really well and expressed it in scripture the apostle Paul for this is what the apostle Paul wrote though I was a blasphemer a persecutor a violent man the worst of sinners Christ Jesus displayed his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life Did, did, did you hear that? He's a nasty, bad, stinking man. And he says, this poison, this inflation of my character, God actually was going to use that as an example to you so that you could know that even a person like that can be redeemed and saved and be changed into someone else. That's brilliant. Uh, in your world of mine, uh, haven't we heard the statements of, well, if Christians were just morally better, then I would believe. Yes, a very famous person said that once. I believe in God. It's just Christians I can't believe in. Paul here reverses that. And so this is what he says in Romans 3.10. Read it with me, if you will. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, at this point, I'll pause because verses 13 to 18, if you see in your Bibles, Paul quotes a verse backing up what he's saying. He quotes it out of the Old Testament. You can consider that on your own time. Uh, verses 20 to 24, let's read together. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What's he saying? Oh, I know, it's a temptation. I feel it in my own spirit. I think God thinks I'm cute. I think God thinks I'm okay. I think the things that I do for him, that he's impressed with. Not according to Paul. <laughs> the temptation of us all throughout history is what's called works righteousness. If I do enough, if I pray enough, if I love people hard enough, if I'm kind to others, somehow God will think that my tally in heaven is enough. Not according to Paul. This is pretty tragic language, isn't it? that he speaks about. What's he saying? He's saying you and I have a poison in our psyche. In other words, uh, let me put it this way. There is one major learning disability 
one developmental delay in discipleship. Uh, in learning about God, what really slows us down? All of us have this. Uh, let me use another analogy. There's an economic term that came out of the 70s that some of you will know about. It's called stagflation. Uh, this is the same thing. Stagflation uh, is an economic term that says persistent inflation, like the rising of tensions or the rising of costs in life, the expansion of our egos, and it's combined with stagnant consumer demand. Relatively high, high unemployment. It was the misery of the 70s, you could say. Stagflation. In other words, let me put it this way, life gets harder and more expensive at the same time. Some of us are experiencing this right now. Stagflation. What is this major learning disability? What is this stagflation that I'm speaking about? Pride. And it's everywhere. Cut across all church contexts, you'll find someone that's pride. Our trouble, actually let me back up a bit. It was, I, I was young, I don't remember, I, I was younger than 10. And someone said to me, Ken, two things you need to do. Number one, know yourself. Well, that's what Socrates said. Know yourself. The second thing is this, know that your pride will kill and steal and destroy. That's not the devil that's doing that. My pride, your pride, has that power, that poison to steal and kill and destroy. Our problem, our trouble, our poison is pride. What is, what is pride? Well, it's our desire our intent desire to have God's authority and God's power and God's freedom and God's independence. Just look at Genesis 3. That's what our pride is. We want these things from God. He's given us life. He's put his image upon us. We think we can attain it at the worst of times. But we can't get it through pride. And we can't get it by puffing ourselves up or by poisoning someone else close by to us. That's not how we'll get there. Pride is the poison of our psyche. So then you'll feel like, well, then Ken, what am I to do with this? Jesus spoke about the fact that the poison comes out of our heart and extends into our lives. What do I, what, Ken, what do I do with this poison? Well, there is a solution. There is a coping mechanism. There is hope for pride. The third blowfish. Can God redeem your blind spots? Your blind spots? Your poison? Well, to do this, we need to take a vast change in perspective. We need to shift gears. And I know your mind may say, Ken, I don't understand. You're going this direction. You're going to shift directions. Yeah, we're going to do something like, call, like repenting. We're going to turn aside from what we've done before and we're going to go into a new direction. Okay? To be true... I may think, or you may think, that a blowfish's spines and size and poison, that a skunk smell that every once in a while appears outside my window and I wonder whether my dog caused it, a porcupine's quills, we may think that those are annoyances, that they, are, uh, they bring about death in our lives, but... Uh, not so for the blowfish or the skunk or the porcupine. Right? They are God-given protection to the blowfish, to the porcupine, to the skunk. These are slow-moving animals that are have relatively poor eyesight. How does God protect them? With spines and a really nasty stink and quills. So God made them this way. And perhaps the slow-moving blowfish and the skunk and the porcupine are onto something. 
maybe there's a scriptural, spiritual lesson in here for us. It is true. We too have an optional defense in our attack, the attack on our mental health. We have it. We have it. Just like the blowfish, the Bible says humility is our self-defense. Uh, so shift gears. We talked about poison, the poison of our pride. What if we could be filled with humility? It changes our perspective. Humility is the best way to inflate yourself, second only to the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Holy Spirit won't fill you up if you're filled with pride. Check out what the Bible says. Our pride deflates the Holy Spirit's power in our life. Our pride empties His power. He'll fill us up. The Holy Spirit will fill us up and fill us up with humility, but only if pride's gone. That's humility. Jesus himself said this, and this is something to be thankful to God for. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. When we think about this inflating of ourselves with humility, well, Jesus' brother James and his best friend Peter spoke about these things. And when you read these two passages, they, they must have been talking to each other. Uh, they didn't steal each other's work. Uh, but when you see it together, and I want to share with you from James 4 and from 1 Peter 5. And I want to share to you a blended scripture here. So this is like a, a, the Ken's contemporary version of the Bible. This is two texts brought together, mashed up if you will. If you read them back to back, you may get the same sentiment. Because James and Peter, James 4, 5 to 10, 1 Peter 5, 5 to 10, this is what it says. Please say this with me. It's brilliant. God jealously longs for his spirit to dwell in us, giving us more grace. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, and he will flee from you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord under his mighty hand and he will lift you up. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Cast all your anxiety on him for he cares for you. Wow. What an incredible text. There's so many promises in this text. Like cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This is brilliant. But it tells you this. You have an enemy. Like a really bad, nasty enemy. And Jesus said he does three things. He steals from you. He kills you. And then destroys. Like how is that possible? If I'm already dead, how does he destroy me? He destroys your reputation. Steals, kills, and destroy. And many of us, in sharing our lives, will say, oh yeah, he did that to me. He's the master of disease. He's a champion of cancer. He does nasty things in our world. That's our enemy. Not each other. So, do you want to be protected against your real enemy? This tells us how. We can be protected against the real enemy, the enemy to the most important part of us, our psyche, our mental health. That, as we said last week, our mental health, our, sorry, our, our psyche is that which goes past death. It survives the death of our body. To be protected against your real enemy, which is evil itself, Humbly fill yourselves with God, the Holy Spirit, through everything you face. 
I don't know about you. <laughs> Imagine every one of you have felt at times humbled by your circumstances. So, Lord, I don't need any more humbling. My life has done enough for that. But there's other times in life in which I was thinking this week about the song that I used to sing jokingly as a child, the country and western song. I won't sing it, but you know the words. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best I can. Can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. Must be one heck of a man. Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best I can. Oh, come on, you've had those days. Doing pretty well? Think you're something? You've also had days in which life has humbled you. This text outlines four attacks to our mental health, and probably more, but just let me highlight these four. These four may be happening all at once in your life, but they happen. The first attack, the first driver of mental health stress is this, my and your immorality. It's found in here in the word sinners. When we break God's law, there's consequences. So we say, oh, why do I feel this attack on my mental health? Because you broke God's law. And that's what happens. There's a cause and effect. God didn't make up a bunch of laws just to give hardship in our life. He did it because he knew who we were. So, first thing, our immorality. And the response to your immorality and mine is repentance. Turning, asking God to stop. The second driver to uh, mental health stress here is our pride. The antidote to pride is humble yourself, which is really interesting. It's really interesting because when Jesus, when God, when the Holy Spirit commands us to do something, we cannot say, oh Lord, that's too hard. I can't do that. He knows us too well. If he commands us to do something, we can do it. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Oh, oh, we need his help to do so, but it may be your pride that says, oh, I can't do that. When God's saying, humble yourself. Those two things are on us. Our immorality, our pride. That's emptying ourselves of that which is stinky, smelly, prickly, poison in our lives. But there's two things in the, this text as well that God allows for a reasons I'll share with you in a moment. Evil does attack us. Sometimes we are victims. We didn't have it coming. We didn't cause it. When evil attacks, this passage tells us to resist the evil one and he'll flee from you. To wait for God's salvation. I know... With great respect, some times in life we have to wait a long time to feel that. But to the attack from evil, we are to resist it. The fourth driver to mental health stresses here in this passage is character building. God loves you so much and he knows the strength that you have, the potential strength that you have, that he will test you. If, you know, when you say, oh, I don't want God to test me. Well, just think back to elementary school. Did you like it when your teachers tested you? Probably not. But you learned of your own capability in the test that you t took. I was in a conversation a couple weeks ago about uh, asking some teachers whether they enjoyed giving tests to their students. And they laughed. No, no, it's not a joy for teachers to give tests to students the joy is seeing them do well in the test think of that God is refining you and I and he is preparing us for heaven character building so when I ask you what's the problem blowfish you may say I, I don't know <laughs> I don't know even when you can't determine an answer for that which is in you, God knows, and he can fill you up and be close to you. God can redeem our mess. Absolutely, he is close and he is for you. So we blowfish, 
I confess. We blowfish, and during the troubles of this life, seek redemption. It's in us. What's fascinating is I uh, studied this, this finding that there is something inside of us. It's life. It's our psyche. That when we undergo stress to our mental health, we start to fight. Well, we complain and we lament and we talk to others about it. That's a really good sign. Because that which is in us that says, no, this is not God's will for me, engages us into the fight. Part of the challenge, I think, today is understanding how we fight, how we respond. So let's speak holistically. Let me share with you just five responses with respect to the fivefold dynamics, the essence of you, your psyche, your mind, your heart, your body, and we together. First of all, number one, your psyche, your soul, your spirit is an invisible entity, moral being designed for everlasting life. It's an essence that's not dissolved by death. You don't end when you die. Bible teaches that. You don't end with your die when you die, your body does. You will continue. You are designed for eternal life. Your psyche belongs to God. He desires that his Holy Spirit would indwell you, like be right beside your psyche. So whatever problem you are facing, will face, or others face that you are caring for, always start with him. Always start with God. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ into the very core of you, like you've always said, God, stay out there, I'll look after me. If you're at that spot whereby you say, wow, I, I need God inside. I've humbled myself to realize I'm pretty bad at this life thing. I need help. You can invite the Holy Spirit into your life. And Jesus says, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will come in, open the door to your psyche and dwell with you. You can do that today. And he makes it clear he's waiting for you. And he intends to grow your character to make you who you are always were destined, destined to become. That's your psyche, your mind. Accept today the truth that you have blind spots, confusion, as we spoke about this week, opposing beliefs. There are things inside your mind, perhaps deceit in your worldview. Ask God to show it to you, gently. That's <laughs> what I suggest. Ask God for help to break down the strongholds of your life, and for those that you love, that perhaps you've been invited to share with them the wisdom to know the pace and the way that you can help them. Ask the question, what you're feeding your mind? And does what you're feeding your mind align with the Holy Spirit? Your heart. Your heart and mind have a poison inside of them. That's what Jesus said. Hard to accept in our present culture. We don't think we're that bad. Our heart has poison. If you want to look at this further, Genesis 8, Matthew 15, speaks about this poison in our life. You can talk to me afterwards that if you want. The evil one's attack on you can actually further pride and arrogance and fear in your life. Question, I guess, is will you let the Holy Spirit align your will with his Or will you seek the contentment and peace that can be yours, even through trials? Your body. <laughs> your body hosts your mind and soul, your spirit. In fact, it's the context of your relationships with others, your body is. So in our conversation today, how have you felt your body inflate or deflate? Have you been annoyed with what I've said if you have been, what are you filled up with? Is this what you're filled up with healthy for you? And last, we all together are blowfish. We all have these characteristics. And we're all just trying to live life without being attacked by evil, right? Paul said it best 
Ephesians 6.12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The people that are annoying in your life, that's not who your enemy is. The people who you wrestle with, that's not who your enemy is. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, blood, but against the rulers, authorities, and powers of this dark world. God has said that you have the capability and the power to fight them. Wow. Are you in a relationship in which you can help others gently address their blind spots? Has someone said to you, I don't know, I just keep seeing to struggle in this way and asked you for help? That's a way that you can connect with them. We all have blind spots. Ignoring your blind spots, me ignoring my blind, blind spots, can be dangerous. But when we love each other together, we can help each other out with blind spots, just like the hair on the back of our head. We all have poison of our psyche. It's called pride. Self-centeredness, arrogance, belligerence, which causes dysfunction. God gives you the power to empty yourself of pride and to be filled with the Holy Spirit who gives you humility. Just by starting these things, you will feel humility filling up your life. And we're all offered help. When we humble ourselves in the mess of our lives, he comes up close to us strengthens our psyche, enriches our mental health. There's no doubt questions that we've talked about today that will raise further conversation with you. You can speak to me afterwards. I'll just be outside or you can connect with me uh, through the website and speak to me about these issues or, or you can connect with a trusted brother or sister or a deacon in our church. These are deep questions, good questions for us to discuss as a church. And as we wrestle with them, I want us to praise God and worship through our next song, which appropriately as Naomi sings for us, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we can truly, as we sing that song, release to him the challenges that we can identify and those we can't. Please stand with me as we sing together, the battle belongs.
at the end of the passages that we read, there's a brilliant reflection that I hope encourages you. Because both James and Peter speak about this call to you to stand firm in your faith. Because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. It's a strange kind of reflection. But what, what in part is telling us is in the body of Christ, we share together all things. You are connected in community to people who love you. You can connect with them this week. I encourage you to draw close to a brother and sister. Find time in which both you and they can lament. Perhaps complain. Pray together. Connect with our church community as well too. And know, yes, you may have struggles. We share together in the body of Christ. And the love and the joy and the peace and the hope he gives. I want to close with what Jesus said when he was in Nazareth, his hometown, before he was actually kicked out of Nazareth. He was in the synagogue one day and he unrolled the scrabble, the, the scrabble, the Sabbath, <laughs> Sabbath day he unrolled the scroll. There was no scrabble back then. He unrolled the scroll and he said this. And keep in mind that in Christ, when he says something, he calls you into it because we're together in his body. That's what Evan shared in his stretch. He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, on you in Christ, because he has anointed me, he's anointed us, to preach good news to the poor, Proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God loves you. God is favorable towards you. This week as you go connecting with your church community, your extended community, your neighbors, share the love of Jesus Christ with them and know that you are loved. Next week, we're going to speak about drink up, oh dear, as we conclude our conversation about a spiritual excursus in mental health. If you're here with us, just please be seated. Thank you for joining us for this service. For more information, visit our website, churchatthecenter.com. God bless. God bless.